table topic is so important and so vital. Table topics and the exercise of impromptu speaking, I really think is an important part of being a, an effective speaker. How do we prepare for table topics? How, how do we practice this important skill? I would argue that the key elements of speaking in general and preparing for your Toastmasters assignments in general and speaking in general apply just as much to being an effective impromptu speaker. Firstly, we're advised when preparing an assigned speech, uh, whether it's a Pathways presentation or even outside of Toastmasters, if we're preparing a speech for a function, for a wedding or a business meeting, to know your subject matter. Choose a topic that you can relate to, that you're passionate about. A subject where you can speak with authenticity, with conviction and with confidence. Now I can hear you argue, Nicholas, that makes no sense. I, I don't know what I'm going to be asked. I don't know what topic I'm going to be presented with. How can I do that? The answer is go with your gut. Follow your instinct. I'll give you an example. I know next to nothing about American sports. I know they play football. I know they play baseball. I know that football, for example, is much like rugby, but with committee meetings and lots of armor and helmets. And it's much slower. And with all due respect to any Americans in the audience, much more boring, much more enjoyable is the game of rugby. Uh, and I know little to nothing about baseball either. But if in a Toastmasters meeting or in a social setting, I were to be given the topic baseball, what am I to do? I know nothing about it. Go with my gut. Go with your instincts. What are the thoughts that come to mind immediately? And why do I say immediately? Well, it's what you most closely associate with the subject. And even doing so, you stand a very good chance of being able to speak about something you know about and relate it back to the topic. For example, when I hear the word baseball, I think hot dogs. I think people wearing caps and sitting in a great stadium. I think sportsmanship. I think teamwork. I think enthusiasm and popcorn and peanuts and teams. And I think people gathering in large groups and the desire many of us have had to gather at large events over the last 20 months when we haven't been able to do so. And so my thought processes start and I can begin speaking on these things and relate them to baseball and relate them to other subjects too, with conviction. I haven't taken time to agonize over the subject and think maybe I could speak about the rules of baseball or the, the merits or demerits of introducing baseball into South African schools or the different organizations that promote baseball in North America, because I would be lost. I would stumble, I would be lost for words. But in speaking about teams, teamwork or sportsmanship or the desire to be in a sports stadium and, and the, the lessons baseball can teach us in general, I can relate it to everyday life and probably therefore to my audience, which will have broad interests as well. Speak what your gut tells you to speak. You will therefore do so with greater authenticity and confidence. That leads me to my second point. Confidence is the name of the game. Being confident lends you a sense and an aura of credibility to your audience. They have a greater likelihood of believing what you have to say, of buying your message, of accepting your arguments. It is so important that you cultivate that manner of confidence. And yes, by hewing to your subject matter and speaking what your gut tells you to speak and following that line of thought, you can be more confident than if you're stumbling for words. But how do I prepare to be confident? It's all well and good to say, be confident. If I'm in a situation, be it a Toastmasters meeting or in another environment where I I think that I'm likely to be called upon to express my views. I try and dress the part. Now, you may see me here before the screen and think, well, underneath that shirt, he's probably wearing a tracksuit pants or shorts. I assure you I'm not. I'm wearing suit pants. I'm wearing socks and shoes. 
I'm dressing the part. I am thus enabled to feel more confident. If I'm in a position to know in advance my environment or the kind of people I'm speaking to, I try and acquaint myself with that in advance too, to ensure that I feel that I'm not on unfamiliar territory. This gives one a sense of confidence too. It's difficult to prepare and admittedly there are times when you don't know what to say. An important factor to remember is that you don't have to launch into the key aspects of the subject matter immediately. We don't need to straight away start talking, for example, to speak to my example earlier about baseball. I don't need to immediately go into that subject matter. I may be in a situation where I strike a complete blank. I don't know what to say. I'm lost for words. I'm flawed. And that happens to the best of us. Even though we can easily say, go with your gut, maybe our gut is silent that day. But we all have the use of our vocal cords. Or if we're taking part, we, we, we do. If we have the use of our, of our voice, we can begin by speaking in general terms about how this is a matter of interest. As we speak and as we are talking, you will see, especially with practice, that your confidence will grow, even if you're not speaking to the subject matter in general. So I might be talking, I'll be given the subject of my opinion on some organization in Australia of which I know nothing. I can begin by saying, people coming together to organize around common goals and common interests is important. If they have a common goal in mind, a mission statement, a vision, coherent leadership, they can achieve their goals, whatever they may be. And as I speak along those lines, I can gain in confidence to go with my gut. When in doubt, honesty is not a flaw. If I truly know nothing about a subject and it is totally foreign to me, then the option is to talk it out, to try and speak as close as possible to the subject matter or what is related to it, what is in its penumbra, if I can call it that, as possible. It is no shame to say that I'm not an expert on this or that organization, but I can speak about organization. Don't be ashamed to say you don't know your subject, that particular subject matter, if it is an impromptu speech. If you've done your best to go with your gut, if you're in a confident space and have done your best to be as confident as you can be physically and mentally, to know your audience and to speak until that confidence grows and you do not know your subject matter that you've been presented with, speak as closely to it as possible. My fourth and final key point is when in doubt, smile. Even in the most serious of situations, a controlled smile, a confident demeanor will take you a long way. It will bury, if you were, or disguise any nervousness you may possibly feel. Bear in mind, if you have difficulty with this, that as in prepared speaking, you are the owner of your message. Not your neighbor, not Uncle Stowe, not Nuili Greeny, not Annette Lovemore, you are the owner of your message, whatever it may be. If I'm called upon to speak about American baseball, what I have to say about it is my message, my opinion, my view. Anka and Louis and Sonati and Annette are not judging me because I'm not drilling down into the rules or the history of baseball. The value that I give to my audience has a value of itself. And even if I cannot even talk about hot dogs and stadiums and the enthusiasm of the audience, if I talk about sport in general and the importance of sport, it's a contribution to a broader conversation. Be confident in that. Hold on to that. Practice. Practice makes perfect. Participation builds proficiency. Whenever the opportunity presents itself, be it in a Toastmasters environment or elsewhere even, seize the opportunity to speak off the cuff. 
The more you do it, the more comfortable you will become with it. Therefore, take these opportunities, seize them, and you will become better. In summary, therefore, number one, go with your gut. Number two, build confidence as best you can. Number three, talk, 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 talk it out. I wish you the very best of luck in your impromptu speaking and building effective confident table topics because that is the mark of a fantastic communicator, Madam Coordinator. Bravo. I think you've given us a lot of food for thought on how to think on our toes. Thank you so much. As Sonata says in the chat, seize the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nicholas. That was really, really useful. All right. So we are on to our next topic of this evening, of this morning, sorry. I'm still in last night. <laughs> and that is Linda Kuchle and Corsi. Ever changing and evolving, she is aptly named the butterfly. She is passionate about personal development and participated in the first digital area contest in 2020. She is about to reveal the skills of a structured speech. Are you ready, Linda Kukle? Yes, I am, Uncle Sto. Um, I'm just going to get my stuff ready, but yeah, I'm ready. Over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Madam Facilitator. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will be going through how to effectively convey your message. So simply put, what is the best way to structure your speech, right? So how many of us have had to prepare a speech on the fly and obviously had no idea how to get started and where is the speech going? And then you just end up in going into tangents and eventually you get a speech, but not one that properly conveys what you are trying to say and at the end of your speech you feel like mm, I could have done better just raise your hand or put it in the chat box how many of us have felt that you know what I've done this speech but it didn't say what I wanted it to say it didn't do what I wanted it to do all right so <laughs> a lot of us and ladies and gentlemen this is not a talk about contest in particular, but more about, are you able to take what you want to say, put it and package it in a way that you feel comfortable in what you're about to say? So as many of you have just put up your hand that I have made a speech, but not one that I have been proud of. Let's go to the first part. So everything starts with your title, okay? And Unfortunately, <laughs> people start with the title rather than ending with the title. And the reason why I say you should end with your title and not start with your title is because while, while the title explains what you are trying to say to your audience, it gives you that little tidbit before you tell people what you're about to tell them. So how many of us remember the slogan for McDonald's? Just shout it out for me. How many of us remember the, log the, logan for, the slogan for McDonald's? I'm, I'm loving, loving it. it. Loving it. Right. Uh, let me pick an easy one. How many of us remember the slogan for BMW? Sheer driving, Sheer driving pleasure. Ooh, right. And... How many of us remember the title of Martin Luther's famous speech? I have a dream. Ladies and gentlemen, and what do all those titles tell you? They tell you, first of all, what to expect. And that is what your title does. Your title tells you what to expect before you even experience that thing. And that is the importance of your title. So what I'm trying to say is your title should convey, should 
tell people what they should expect in your speech before they even hear your speech. So let's say you're trying to tell people that global warming is an inevitability. You don't say global warming is an inevitability and we should not, um, and we should do something about it. No, no, no. Because A, you are scaring people and B, you are putting people off with that negative emotion that you've tied in. So your title should tell people what they're expecting, but in addition to that, it should be appealing because I am not about to listen to someone if I am not appealed by them. That's why these two points come in when it comes to your title. First, write your title last. Second, write an appealing and a title that tells people what they should expect before they hear what you're about to say. Moving along, make your message memorable. So going back to the I had a dream speech, what was it all about? Just yell it out for me. What was it all about? I mean, it's a really long speech. So there must be something that clicks in your head. I have a dream that one day all men dot, 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 dot. What, what, does that, what does that speech tell you? What, does it, what do you remember? Zanele, I heard you say you, you got it right. What did it, what did, what does it, what does it, what message clicks in your head about I have a dream? Um, basically, he was speaking more along the lines of um, unity amongst races, especially in the American um, society and not um, putting color before everything um, when we interact, when people interact with one another. Mm. in short thank you Zanele so short and sweet ladies and gentlemen I have a dream is about unity it's about bringing people together irrespective of creed irrespective of race irrespective of class we are all humans so that is a memorable message and anything worth saying is worth remembering. That is what you should make sure. Anything worth saying is worth remembering. So if anybody walks up to me and say, I read, I heard a speech that was done by you and it spoke about global warming. That means that I have done the one thing that any message should do, which is be memorable. It must stick in people's heads. When they think of you, it must click in their heads that she once said this because we are here on this earth to leave our marks. So does everyone feel like they have that one message that no matter what happens is memorable in other people's heads? We all have that speech, right? I'm not going to tell people which, which speeches I remember about them, but there are a lot of people that are sitting right here in this meeting. And I remember the particular speeches about them and their message stuck with me. Actually, some of their speeches have contributed to who I am today. Now, now you've got an impactful title and a memorable message. So now what? You must actually write the speech get to it. So I will give you the typical structure, the introduction, the body, and the conclusion. That is what a speech is. But you must think beyond what a typical structure of a speech is and think about what the introduction, the body, and the conclusion must convey, because this is a build up to your conclusion and the conclusion closes it off like a good movie so what are you what are you so you've got your introduction you've got your your message it's memorable global warming is going to happen unless we do something brilliant now how do you make sure that you flow that this is one thought because people have only so much concentration. 
what do you have to do? I'm going to make it simple. You got to have your introduction. And what your introduction does is it gives background. Okay, it gives people what are we trying to get to? You are starting the engine of your car. You are starting to get people's attention. And this is why most Toastmasters say your introduction must be captivating. Your introduction must be captivating because how you start is how you're going to finish. It doesn't help halfway through your speech, you go, ah, ah, and then people start having to pick up because now people who have to do a catch up game mentally get exhausted. So your introduction must be captivating. And after you're done with your introduction, you move on to your body. And this is the trick your body must have very few but very in-depth substantiation to your introduction. So whatever you said in your introduction, your body must build onto that. And that is done by having few but in-depth points. Having one truly drilled in point is 10 times better than having 10 different points, but all shallow and touched upon. Sinate, I know you are more of the technical type, so I'm going to trap you here. What is the most important point when you have to remember something? What, is, what, what, what matters when you have to remember something? If I tell you 10 different facts, and I tell you one fact, but I drill onto it, I hammer down on this point, will you remember the one hammered down point or will you remember the 10 points, but I just touched on them quickly? Our human brains remember fewer details. So the one point is something I'll remember. Your 10 points, I might remember one or two out of your 10 points, but I won't remember all of them. Fantastic. So ladies and gentlemen, Sinati said it perfectly. And I intentionally did that because she is more of a technical thinker than I am. So she blatantly stated that our human brains can only comprehend what is repeated, what is hammered down on, what is substantiated, as opposed to something that is said, touched upon, said, touched upon, said, touched upon. That is your body. Now, your conclusion. So you've told us something, you've given us background, you've hammered down on a point, and now you need to conclude. Get to the point and tell us what you want, to, what you want us to do at the end. It's great to know something, but what must I do with this information? You've given me information in your introduction and body. Now your conclusion plays as your closer and therefore what must I do with this information? Please? And that's how you structure your speech. Your introduction, body and conclusion are much more important than, your, than actually what they sound like. It's not just your body introduction and conclusion. It is your background, it is your point substantiated, and it is your closer, and therefore, what must I do with this information? Now, ladies and gentlemen, you have your message, you've crafted your message, and now you have given it a title. Sheer driving experience. I'm loving it. I have a dream. Now, I will hammer down on this one point, which is no matter what you write about, you have a voice that all of us want to hear. We're proud. We take time and effort to listen to you. Speak to add value to others. Speak to add values to others. And I'm taking a bit of a Lucinda Harmon's quotation, but speak to add value. Never speak empty. That is what brings impact. You are speaking to add value. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before I, I blast off and hand back to our Zoom Master of the morning, I am going to ask that each and every one of you just give me one point of happiness 
that this one message that you have that you would like to convey. And I would like you to take the time to think, do you have an introduction, body, and conclusion that you can build on top of that? And in addition to that, do you have a title for that? Because if you have those three things, your structure, your message, and your title, ladies and gentlemen, you have just done a speech worth saying. But in addition to a speech worth having and saying, if it adds values to other, to other individuals, you have managed to create a world-class speech. Thank you, Madam Zoom Master. Thank you to everyone for listening. I hope I have just added just that little extra to your morning. Back to you, Zoom Master of the morning. Bravo. Thank you so much for that comprehensive look at how to structure an effective message. You've given us a whole lot of points and really useful information as well. What I particularly enjoyed was um, choose your title after writing your speech. Because the other day I wrote a speech and the title, I, I thought of it before I wrote the speech. And in the end, I don't think it was the best title. It didn't really match the whole vibe of the speech. And I think if I'd forced myself to think up something afterwards, yeah, it could have been a bit better. So thank you so much for all those awesome tips and tricks. For some more tips and tricks, our next speaker is here. Now, Marcus Mangani is currently a member of L'Avenir Toastmasters Club an Anglo-Francophone club, so they speak English and French, and they're always seeking opportunities to, he's always seeking opportunities to hone and better his MC and public speaking skills. Current reigning public speaking champion for Division L 2021, with hopes of going all the way one day, just like the current public speaking champion Verity Price. Marcus says that every human experience is a story. And right now, he is going to be giving us tips and tricks on preparing for your contest speech. Marcus, over to you. Many, many, many thanks, uh, Madam Zoom Master, aka MC for the day. And good morning to all our resident Toastmasters and guests that would be joining us online today. Now, I deliberately didn't blur out, you know, my background because I want to show one other element that comes in preparing for our contest speech online. The worst can happen. Network can disappear. Your speaking stage may have a nuclear explosion happen to it and it's in shambles. Or better yet, your device may choose not to turn on. But that means one thing. You always need to have an alternative, more especially when you are going to compete online. Anything can happen. So prepare for it with time. Prepare extremely early. An hour early won't hurt anything so that you see whether your device turns on, your speaking stage is good, your lighting is also good. And yeah, take it from there. Now, every human experience is a story. Now my Toastmasters context, I mean contest experience is my own story which, like the previous speaker, Lindo Gutle, alluded, with a speech, you need a title, you need a body, you need a, I mean, introduction, body, and conclusion. Same happened with me. Now, my experience started off with me thinking of the title first. And this title was aligned to a human experience that I had experienced. So once upon a time, I ran a hurdles race in high school let alone not being a hurdles jumper or a good runner, but I did that. And that's where I got the inspiration to deliver the speech titled Hurdles of Life. Now, this was more about me sharing a message that in life, we are all running a race. And in this race, there are multiple hurdles that we come across. Could be hurdles of parenting, could be hurdles 
that relate to finances, could be a mental illness hurdle, or it could be a physical hurdle, but there's multiple hurdles. But at the end, in us running our races, we still need to conquer those hurdles. Now, here are my tips and tricks of how I prepared for my contest speech. Now, one other Toastmaster once asked me, were my heart and mind in sync? Yeah, were my heart and mind in sync? And I thought to myself, you actually need to get your heart and mind in sync. Because when you are competing, believe you me, your emotions and your thoughts are going to run as wild as a wild mustang. But now you need to be a cowboy and lasso those thoughts and emotions and allow them to align. Because in so doing, you will allow yourself to be composed, confident, and remember to be compassionate to yourself. So those are the first three tips that I will give that be composed, be confident, and be compassionate to yourself. Now you're thinking, how can you be composed? Well, one, this is the first tip. Breathing is a basic of life, right? And when you take a breath, much to what we do in Toastmasters when we say pause, you allow yourself to bring, your, uh, to bring yourself back to yourself. That allows you to be composed. Now, if you apply that and many other breathing techniques that you may find online, this will definitely ensure that you become composed as you prepare for your country's speech. Now, two, confidence. And you are wondering, how can you be confident? Now, I believe everyone online knows how to boil an egg or brew some coffee or better yet spread butter on a slice of bread. Now, while doing that, you know there's a Gordon Ramsay out there or a Jamie Oliver who might probably do it better. But while you are doing that, you are doing that as yourself and you are confident in that time. You're confident in yourself being a master barista who is making a delectable cup of coffee. That's confidence. As you spread that butter on your bread, you're doing it as yourself. And that is being confident. As you boil that egg to whatever, I would say, a setting you would like it to be at, whether it's yolky, whether it's hard, but you're doing that as yourself. Now, confidence just comes straight by just being yourself. So remember to always be yourself. And the third and final point in this first setting is be compassionate to yourself. Now I'm an avid Transformers fan and there's one scene within Transformers Age of Extinction where Kate Yeager, which is played by Mark Wahlberg, is interacting with Optimus Prime. And Optimus Prime asks him a question, how many more of my kind must sacrifice, must we sacrifice to atone for your sins? And Cade responds with saying, why do you think being human means? That's what we do. We make mistakes. And sometimes out of those mistakes come the most amazing things. So do not be afraid to make mistakes as you prepare for your contest speech. But at the same time, when you make those mistakes, be compassionate with yourself. This will allow you to enjoy your public speaking journey. You'll be composed. You'll be confident. You will deliver with a composed aura, a confident stance, and you remember to be compassionate to yourself. Now, you may ask yourself, in that preparation, there are opponents. And in those opponents, it might happen that some of them are past public speaking champions. What do you do then? Maybe you're thinking of running away, quitting, and not competing. Maybe you're thinking, nah, you're too small to be playing in that field. No, you're not. You competing is already testament that you're big enough to be playing in that field, even if it consists of past speaking, I mean, past public speaking champions such as myself. Now, be reminded, there will always be someone who is smarter than you in the room, but that never takes away from the knowledge that you know. So even in a contest, as much as there's a past champion, it doesn't take away from you 
being a champion in your own right. Now, you may gain knowledge and more insights when you listen to the ex public to the past public speaking champions and leverage of their experience. Your attitude of wanting to learn and leveraging of the experience will make you a better public speaker, believe you me. And when your mind and heart is in it, your heart also supporting your mind, then you will not go wrong. Now, one other thing I used to tell myself is the contest is also proof of how much I am chasing my investment in Toastmasters and also to display how much I've learned in Toastmasters and how I'm applying it. Therefore, I first compete with myself. And the better I become with competing with myself, the better it is that I will display it when I compete with others. And better yet, I'm a champion already because when I compete with myself, either I come first, second, or third, it's all up to me. But by so doing, I prepare myself to be that champion. Now, it is always good to get feedback as you traverse your public speaking contest journey. Now, when I went through to the area contest, one of my, 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 my Toastmasters club peers, Frank speaking, gave me a call and asked me, do you have a speaking coach? I'm like, is there such a thing as a speaking coach when you're doing Toastmasters? He's like, yes, for contest, you should have one at most. I'm like, no, I don't. Then he put his hand up and offered to be my speaking coach. So yes, one other tip, get a speaking coach. That speaking coach will help you see all the cracks or all the gaps that you may have in your speech that you can close up to have a very good speech. Now, the first thing Frank asked me to do, Frank Turo, for, for, for most you might know, he asked me to deliver the speech that I delivered in the area contest. And post doing that, he then started giving me feedback. Now, believe you me, some of his feedback was as sweet as a Nutella waffle, and most of it was as bitter as a ripened lemon slice. But it was easy to consume the sweet, the, the sweet Nutella waffle feedback, but it was hard to consume the ripened lemon slice feedback. But that ripened lemon slice feedback was the feedback I needed the most because that's the feedback that allowed me to get my speech in order, to get my structure in order, and to also deliver my speech in a manner that would be receptive to the audience. And like Frank would always say, we are not striving to have a perfect speech, but we are striving to have a speech that resonates with the audience. And better yet, we are striving to have a speech that resonates with the person he wrote it for. At most, you either write your speech for yourself or a loved one or the nation. But when you do that and you're thinking of them, then you will start preparing your, yourself to resonate with that person, to resonate with the audience. And in so doing, you will have a perfect speech, as you would say. Now, accept all forms of feedback from your, uh, from your speaking coach. Believe you me, it will take you that distance. Now, Frank, he would tell me to cut out all the unnecessary parts in my speech. To me, they felt necessary. But to him as an audience member at that time and as my coach, he saw fit that in the absence of that and in the addition of this, your speech becomes better. And so doing, it allowed me to progress in my public speaking, uh, I would say, journey. Now, you must also remember, this is my last tip. There are Ex there's extreme significance in your words as an orator. Now, when you're there, yes, you're competing with other opponents who are proving how good you are as a public speaker. But at the end, you must be using your own words to add value into the lives of others. Now, I must always remember that words carry a lot of raw power. Yet one learns how to harness that raw power and use it for the upliftment of those who lend their ears to them. So do just that. Just like electricity travels through pylons before it gets to our homes and to our plugs and we make use of it. Same with our words. We should allow them to travel between our hearts, our minds, and our tongues. When it goes through your heart, 
you will make sure or ensure that there is love around your words. And when it goes through your mind, you will ensure that these words are words that are good enough to be heard by someone. And when it passes through your tongue, you will taste those words and ensure that they are kind enough to be shared with someone. Because words have the power to grow a plant or a person, and they also have the same power to destroy them. So choose them wisely in their raw state. And you will not go wrong if you count down from five every time you need to say something, because that will allow you to process those words through your heart, your mind, and taste them with your tongue. And then you will deliver words that will empower and uplift others. Now, to wrap it all up, with every human experience being a story, your preparation to your contest speech or contest journey is your own story too. Now, do not forget to be composed. Breathe. It's a basic of life. If you're not breathing, you're not alive. Don't forget to also be yourself, irrespective of who's in the room. Be yourself. Be that master barista who makes a delectable cup of coffee. Whether Jamie Oliver is here or not, nah, that shouldn't matter. And be compassionate to yourself. You can only make mistakes that you can learn from. And moreover, get a speaking coach. And upon getting that speaking coach, accept their feedback. Receive it extremely well. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. And better yet, use your words to uplift others because your words carry power. And as orators, we need to be using them wisely. Now, one final tip. Every, exper every human experience is a story, yes. Now, I am still continuing on that experience of learning how to focus on the camera. Because every other day on Zoom, I'm always looking at myself. So the learning hasn't stopped. So never forget to be teachable every other day and every other time, whether it's with your coach or with your peers, but be teachable. And Andrew is still teaching me. Andrew Turo is still teaching me how to focus on the camera and not myself. But I will get it right. When I get it right, Verity will be handing over the trophy to me. Back to you, Madam Zoom Master, a.k.a. MC. Woohoo! Bravo. Oh, my word. Okay. I got so many nuggets out of that. So I'm just going to share a few, play a few back to you guys. Um, be composed, confident, and compassionate. He used a triad. You guys know what that is, Toastmasters, right? And then the importance of the pause and those breathing exercises that you recommended. I really, really liked that tip. Getting a speaking coach, what an obvious idea. Like, why wouldn't I have thought of that? <laughs> and then your final point really um, hit home for me because recently I've been going through the four agreements by Miguel Ruiz. And the first agreement, it's a book that he's written. The first agreement is be impeccable with your word. And that really is about making sure that you do speak everything out of love and out of a place of goodness and I think that really resonates with with what you said there thank you so much and um, I see we've got some questions in the chat but we're going to get to them during our Q&A session I'll try and backtrack to them um, so thank you so much Marcus now we need to know how to use our talking space effectively so Nomonde Boy is going to be facilitating this next segment, and she has been a Toastmaster for six years. She's achieved the Advanced Leadership Gold under the traditional program, and she is a life coach and a facilitator. And I'm pretty sure she wouldn't mind being your speech coach either. Nomonde, are you ready? There you go. Cool. Let's add. Over to you, Nomonde. Yep. Um, good morning, everyone. Excited to come and share the bits of insights that I have with you this morning. The crisis of COVID pushed myself and you. It compelled us this morning to be on the screen. 
rectangular, some devices that we use are handheld. Who would have thought that we would not be going about shopping on a Saturday, but stuck here, going back to the basics of Toastmasters. The screen, this rectangular place, is our speaking space. We need to use it carefully, optimally. The functions you find, you play around with them before you come online. We have seen the worst online when we engaged in virtual meetings. One time in a meeting, somebody spotted this on my screen. You may ask yourself, when they focused on your speaking, what were they doing there? It's important that we have backgrounds that are blurred, that we remove clutter. I have seen blankets, I have seen many things. So make sure that your speaking space is neat. It doesn't have things that will take the attention away from what you are coming to deliver to other things like this, where people were focusing on things that were not important. <laughs> Further on, what will go with this? It's good lighting. The light may be natural. I'm using natural light this morning. Or artificial lighting, people have ring lights. And I guess you can uh, chat in the, uh, 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 you can tap in the chat box, what other devices we use to optimize and to deliver the best message and optimize your engagement with audiences on the virtual screen. Please share with us, what do you use except that? Some use bedside lamps, many things. Some have uh, used their cell phone torches to amplify the light that they are uh, using for their screen. When we speak online, it doesn't mean now we need to come with our morning gowns or our, our PJs. Maybe just to be decent, if you have a, 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 a check uh, DJ, uh, a, a PJ shirt that you're putting on, take your <laughs> jacket and cover that so that you can be presentable on screen. The colors also matter so that they do not blend with your background. Make sure that they don't, so that you don't blend in and we, we, we battle to see you. There are few things that COVID has really um, presented to us. When written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One presents a danger and the other represents opportunity. It presented to us an opportunity to connect globally. So when you connect globally, you want to make impact. Gone are the days when we use to enjoy face-to-face -face meeting on your left, and now we are staring at you on the screen. This also comes with its own challenges, maintaining this amount of speaking space that you are uh, 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 allocated. Virtual engagement doesn't differ from being on face-to-face -face meeting. What changes is that the, your, your area is now compressed, is not as big as you would walk around in that conference room when you were at your club, where you, when you, when you are allocated that big space, it's not as, as easy as that. Now you have to maximize speaking on this. And I, I think there are people who are really uh, experts in, in, in making sure that they can guide you and make sure that you maximize that space. How do we get attention in the virtual uh, meetings? How do we get engagement? Remember the shortfalls that can, uh, that can come also with, um, with, with, with all virtual meetings. Somebody can please share maybe their own experience. 
of the failures of virtual meetings. Just one person. Remember this picture. Anyone willing to share? There are virtual meeting failures. I have one. Um, yeah. it, it happened at work uh, last week, actually. And um, <laughs> one of my colleagues had just taken a shower and she didn't realize she left her camera on. So let's just leave it at that. It was not a good day for her. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Anke. So those failures can really come to the fore, especially on the virtual stage. So make sure that you have your planning, your ducks in a row, so that we cannot have the situations of a cat and a man. I also How see a couple of comments just in the chat for interest sake, load shedding and losing connection yeah. at a critical time of contest. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. How do you grab somebody's attention in a virtual meeting? to keep it interesting and to keep it flowing is that you arouse curiosity. Uh, you, when you arouse people's curiosity, you come with stuff that will really grab their attention. In my final year of high school, over 30 years ago, I did something that I regret. People want to listen. I wonder what she did. Use quotations differently. A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. But so is the journey leading to nowhere. I have been on that journey that led me nowhere. So you, you're using quotations differently and people are willing to listen. You're online, remember, you're not in a live meeting where you will be seeing as if you are chewing chappy or passing notes around. Make startling assertions. Maybe you can type a startling uh, assertions that you've made as a speaker so that you may share with other people. Participation is difficult on the virtual world. When you are staring at the screen as a speaker, looking at Nicholas Mitchell's picture, looking at Anke Stowe as a Zoom master. You looking at the co-host and looking at other things. You don't know how your message is in lending. Your attention grabbing insights will work for you. Connect with the audience. Keep eye contact. Matimu spoke to that. And I believe I'm still on that journey also of making sure that I maintain good eye contact so that I communicate and be in conversation with you. As a speaker, you collaborate with people. Collaboration is an understanding that you do not own wisdom. I think Nicola spoke to that, that sometimes you're not a subject expert, but you love to bring the subject to the for to the audience so that you can share the quality so that people can benefit from that. Wisdom is shared. There might be people in your audience that know more. Imagine arousing their curiosity and you know igniting that thing that wants them to communicate with you. Feedback is important. How people feel. How did they, uh, they, 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 they experience you as a speaker? What impact did you make on them? We are on virtual stage, but still your body speaks. We need your gestures if you are standing. Your hands, your body speaks, your face speaks your frowns, your surprises, even your shock speaks. It is important that you make sure that your body communicates with the people that you are speaking to. You, you, your, your eye contact, your gesture, when you are sitting, your posture is important. 
You can't be sitting slouching. Your ears, your hands, and your hips should be aligned. Your voice delivery. Pace yourself. Pause for impact. Enunciate every word. Don't swallow your consonants at the end. Make sure your voice is congruent to the message. When you speak, be authentic. Let what you are speaking come from knowing that you want to make an impact. You want people to gain quality out of what you are speaking. Speak out of authority because confidence has been spoken about. If you're not as confident, or confident in what you are delivering, we do not believe your message. And you will also begin to doubt yourself. Technology is important. Anyone who's willing to share, when we speak of technology, what are we talking about? My internet this morning nearly made it impossible for me to be presenting. What other factors may contribute? Load shedding is one of them. What else do you know about that can lead to a failure in terms of technology? Anyone willing to share? A bad microphone. <laughs> yes. Losing connection at the critical time. Zoom not working. I battled with Zoom yesterday. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Toastmasters, speaking virtually might look at as impossible, but it can be done. We don't know where when will we go back to virtual meetings, but keep this in mind. Make sure your virtual background is up to point. Make sure the clutter is taken away. Do not have such around when you know you're going to be showing stuff on screen. Make sure that your body speaks, your voice communicates, and your technology functions. Make plans if you know that something might just happen. Data might just decide on that day that it finishes quickly. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you so much. I feel like now I have a better idea of how to use my talking space effectively. And I've certainly dealt with uh, many of the topics that you dealt with, this technology not working. Um, I'm, I'm quite tech savvy. And even for me, sometimes things just switch off, blue screen, sorry for you, smiley face, sad face. Yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you so much for helping us prepare for writing a good speech for contest. All three of our facilitators, that was a really well-rounded look at how to write a great speech. And um, we're gonna flip the script a little bit. I, I did post the program for everybody in the chat. Um, and our next segment is supposed to be delivering an effective evaluation. But before we get off the topic of writing a good speech, we got someone in the room who wrote a pretty good speech, <laughs> just saying. Um, I don't have her full bio with me, my apologies, I just realized. <laughs> and so I am going to call up our surprise guest a little bit earlier than planned. Surprise guest, would you mind switching on your camera? <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> it is Verity Prize. Please unmute yourselves. Give a yeah. round of applause to the world champion of public speaking. Yes. Yay. 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 Oh. Oh. Wow. Wow. Oh. So good to be here. <laughs> we are so excited to have you today. 
And you are literally the world champion of public speaking. Um, I mean, those words, as I said them, I was like, is that for real? I know. Uh, <laughs> how, how are you still, are you still reeling from it? Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's surreal it doesn't it doesn't yeah I can't really compute it feels like I dreamt it also because it was virtual it's like did that really happen maybe it only happens again next year on a real stage but let's <laughs> own it because we brought it back to Africa <laughs> exactly so our very own Verity Prize from District 74 what is your club name again you're in uh, Cape Town right yeah Post -Ed. Post -Ed. all right so that is our champion everybody and we have brought her in here um, basically just for you to ask any questions that you might have. Um, so I'm opening it up. You're welcome to type into the chat. Um, or if you would like to raise your hand, um, then I'll invite you to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. Um, but I think I'll, I'll just kick us off um, while people are, are getting warmed up. Um, so please pop your questions in the chat or put your hand up. Um, but I think what I'm most curious about is how so for different levels of of contest you had to have different speeches right two two speeches two so different. one speech all the way to semi-finals and then you need a brand new speech for the finals so so that challenge of creating a brand new speech for the finals how did that feel because you've already gotten so far with your first speech and you've done so well it's one of those can i top this moment kind of feelings how difficult was it to write that second speech okay so that's a very good question because often if you watch the finals you'll go oh three or four of those speeches were good but the others were okay how did the people get there but if you watch their semi-finals you go oh my word I see how they got to the semi-finals because a lot of people maybe don't think they're going to win their semi-finals so they don't work on a final speech and I just was like, if I'm doing this, I'm doing it 100%. So I started writing my final speech after I won district. I still had two months before I would hear if I'd even made the semifinals. But I started trying to find a speech and it was really hard. I wrote three speeches, six or seven versions of each. They weren't working, weren't working, weren't working. And 100 days before the finals, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning, very inconvenient time for inspiration to strike. And I was reminded of a a version of a speech I'd actually competed with in 2015, which revolved around my dad's letter. It was a different story, but it revolved around my dad's letter. And I sat down and I, I well, I got up and tried to sneak off and not wake the house up. And I started writing it. And when I finished, I was like, this is my speech for the finals. The story didn't change much over a hundred days, but the emphasis of what I was focusing on within that and the message changed so many times. I wrote 32 different versions and uh, I only got to write a different story as a message statement 10 days before the finals. But I just kept writing it like, hopefully I'm going to win. Hopefully I'm going to get there. And this needs to be the best speech I've ever written. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. As Marty Moore says in the chat, it's inspiration strikes at odd times. You got to do what you got to do. It doesn't keep <laughs> sneak, business sneak hours. Around it in does the dark. not keep business hours. <laughs> <laughs> That's what energy drinks are for. Yeah. And uh, now we have a couple of questions. Uh, Francois, Francois Bowen, please go ahead. Good morning to everyone. My question to you, TM Verity. In your interview on the Toastmasters International um, YouTube, the interview with the former champion, something you said that struck me, which is in preparing for, in preparing for the contest, you actually months in advance um, did a lot of practice and you had somebody like your sister who was there to help you. Coming down to the coming down to the grind, get selected, and now you um um get selected. You then at one point had to say, you know, I can't look at the speech anymore. Why? Because you're gonna start doubting what you've done, and I I got to the point I was getting so much feedback. I visited. 42 clubs in 16 countries on five continents in the two months leading up to the finals. And I received so much feedback and I kept changing, kept changing, kept changing. 
And at some point, and, and this is any time in your life when, you, when you're trying to do something and achieve something, at some point you've got to commit to what you're doing, whether you're designing a house or a product or writing a speech, at some point you've got to go, this is it. There might be a small tweak I could make, like right at the end, about a day before the finals, we added in kissing frogs as a, as a fun little statement. And I love that I had that. But I stopped listening to feedback at least a week before each of my speeches. And then I just sat with it and I worked with it. And the day before I said, let's put this to bed. This is the speech I'm going to give. So this is about trusting yourself. And I think if you keep working, keep changing, you might step in with not the full confidence that, that you want. Thank you. Great, great insights. We've got another hand up, Copano. Please go ahead and ask a question. Hi, Copano. <laughs> Are you there? We can't quite hear you. I'm here. Oh, you can hear something now? No. Uh, Kapane, there's no sound coming from your side. Do you maybe just want to do a mic check or try a different headset or something? Oh, I think it's network. I think it's network, Copano, by the yeah. sounds of it. Would you would you type your question in the chat, please? And and then we'll ask it to Verity, um, if that's all right. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, in the meantime, maybe... Yeah, no, it's just breaking up, Copano. We can't hear you at all. Please, if you could type your question in the chat. You can't hear no, 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 it's just choppy and breaking up completely. All right. I just see, I just want to answer a question came in about how I experience my experience in evaluation contest contributed to my international speech contest win. Go so hugely, hugely. And I'm so glad that Louis is doing a session on, on giving effective evaluations after this, because until you can give feedback on a speech and help someone else improve as a speaker and understand all the nuances of what go into a great speech, it's very hard to write that great speech yourself. So evaluations are for me, the, the learning and the platform of which I've built all my speech writing and doing an evaluations contest really stretches that because you are practicing how to really get into the nitty gritty of what makes a great speech and how to improve it. Because it's one thing to understand the theory, it's like, can you apply it? And evaluations help me to learn to apply that knowledge to my own speeches. Great. I'm going to go to another question from the chat and then we've got two more hands up. How do you start your contest journey? Competing in table topics contest, evaluation contest, or do you go for speech direct, speeches directly? What should your strategy be? I think it's different for everyone. My first contest was a speech contest in 2012. And like many new Toastmasters, I didn't even know that Toastmasters was bigger than my club in Fishhook. I thought that's where it started and ended. So I was horrified because I didn't work very hard and my sister beat me. And then I discovered that we'd actually entered an international contest. I was like, what? I was so irritated. I hadn't given it my all. But I watched her speech journey. She went to the world semifinals where she came second. And that was when I saw how much work went into it. So then I was afraid to enter for quite a few years. And so I entered evaluations, table topics, and I, I built up my abilities there. But the only reason I wasn't entering the speech contest was, well, two things. The one was a mindset of like, oh, you know what? I don't have what it takes to win at this style of speaking. And I don't have the speech. And I think that's a terrible mindset to have because even just entering at a club level and it might not go further than that, you're still going to work harder on that speech than you do on a normal club meeting. So don't wait for the perfect speech and go, I'm only going to do it when it's perfect. Just enter, just show up and try. I mean, Lance Miller, who was my coach, he entered 13 years in a row before he became world champion. He lost nine years in a row at his club. You know, just to give you some inspiration, this isn't about entering and winning. Uh, the one thing I'm saying in all the workshops I'm doing around the world now is only one person is guaranteed to win this contest. Everyone else is guaranteed to grow. And if you enter with the mindset of I'm going to do this to grow as a speaker and as a person, you will get value from it. Absolutely. 
Um, I see some hands went down, so just put your hand back up if you still want to ask a question, but I'm going to go over to Alunga. Please ask your question. Hello, is my is my connection fine? Is, is it all yes, good? Yes, it is. Yeah. All good. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, firstly, I just want to say, wow, it's it's actually, it's a bit of a sobering thing to find out that you've delivered your speech 42 times at 42 different clubs in 60 countries. That is just crazy. Just to <laughs> comment on that. And it wasn't 42 times. Oh. Some of those clubs, I did two speeches and <laughs> I went back to those clubs. So it was well over 150 times. <laughs> yeah. uh, so let's just say you've done it lots. <laughs> yeah, lots. Uh, lots, lots, lots. But this is something that's more for me. So I'm quite young and it's, it's, it's kind of, I've had this insecurity maybe about not being able to find the stuff to speak, to speak about. But so you say that you, that you, that you came up with this, with this idea for your winning speech up at three, at three in the morning, but what maybe could be the ways or what are the things that give you a better chance at you know, finding those ideas and um, actually foraging within yourself for, you know, the, the ingredients for this speech of yours. Um, like, because we all have the wisdom, we have the quality, we have the substance within ourselves and within our past, but how maybe will you increase your chances to find those ideas as you're writing your speech? What a great question, Alunga. So first one is to start a story journal. So actually, even if you sat down after this meeting today, what are the moments and memories in my life that have made a difference or have shaped me or taught me something or were just funny or were mm. humiliating and I wish it hadn't happened and I was like, oh, I can't believe I did that. Failures, mm. you know, anything, their successes, failures, challenges and start writing those down because then your age has got nothing to do with it. In fact, mm. my semi-final speech was about something that happened to me when I was 16. And then I tell more of the story, but the, the foundational story happened at 16. So all of us have got stories in our lives that have been significant. But the 1995 champ world, uh, world champion, Mark Brown, he says, your story doesn't have to be sensational. It has to be sincere. So again, if it's a story that you can talk about in a sincere way, and I promise you, I do believe that someone could win the world championships of public speaking, telling people how to boil an egg. They could be telling a story about the first time they boiled an egg and they got it horribly wrong and the life lesson they learned from it. Like <laughs> Prez Vazilev won with how to change a tire. We're talking about yeah. a flat tire. So, so I think we all need to remember that. It doesn't have to be like a death or a bankruptcy or a, it could have been a small, simple thing. Mine was watching my mom pick up litter and I didn't want to listen to her. I was a difficult teenager. That yeah. story got me to the finals. So look at your life and find those moments that have meant something to you or that have humbled you or taught you something and then work on crafting the story because mm. that's where the craft comes in. How do you tell that story? How do you make it compelling? Build that curiosity that was being spoken about earlier so that the audience leans in and they feel connected to a universal experience. Mm. Doesn't matter what the story is, to be honest. It's how we tell it and how we build that interest and that intrigue and that humor and then bam, land a message or a learning. That's the that's the craft. That's what we're learning at Toastmasters. Okay, thank you so much. You're a rock star. Just to put that out there, thank you so much. <laughs> so I'm keeping an eye on the time, Verity. We're going to cut yes. it off at 25 past. Is that all right? So Perfect. give yes. it five more minutes. So Copano did manage to get the question into the chat. Hi, yeah. my champ. Number one, how do you deal with contest fatigue? And number two, what advice do you have on effectively transitioning from one polished speech? to a newer, less familiar speech? Oh, great questions. So the contest fatigue is very real. I, I did suffer from full burnout after the contest. I fell over and I actually cried a lot. And you think, really, you should be happy, but I was exhausted. <laughs> and then I had to get myself back up again. Hey, good morning. <laughs> the, yeah, so the contest fatigue, you need to give yourself some time away from the speeches sometimes go and do something else, change of scenery. I'm lucky I've got a little boy so I could go play with him, go see a friend, have a cup of coffee. But I think if you enter this contest and, and when you get to the higher levels, it consumes you. I've spoken to more than 25 champions and finalists because we're all on a Facebook group together. And I've actually got all the, the stats here. So I'll just share with you kind of the effort that goes in. 
So more than 70% of them practice at more than 40 clubs and more than 200 times of their speech. Uh, they all had written about 70% of contestants write 30 versions or more of their speech and they, they practice an average of two to four hours a day in the last two months. So it is exhausting. And the only way I can say I dealt with that was to keep reminding myself that I had something I wanted to say to the world and that I was also trying to win this for Africa. It really wasn't just about me. I was like, for goodness sake, why hasn't this come back? I really believe if one person wins, everyone else will start winning. Because when my sister won uh, and went to district for our club, in 20 years, no one had ever gone to a district contest. Every year since she won, someone from Two Oceans Toastmasters has gone to a district contest. So hopefully I've shattered the ceiling and one of our future champions is sitting here right now. So that's the, the contest fatigue. You've got to just keep reminding yourself why, take a bit of time out and then come back again. Writing that second speech and getting familiar with it is write it early. Like, in fact, if you're thinking of entering the contest now, you could be working on two speeches. It can split your focus a little bit, but work on multiple speeches till you find the ones that excite you. But I started working on my second speech 100 days. Well, I got to the one that I gave 100 days before. I'd started working on it straight after I won district. Um, and so I was practicing my semi-final speech and then I was running through my other speech ideas also. So, and then you keep going, keep going and it takes hours. There's, there's no short way around this. You can't bash out a champion speech in two or three versions. It does take hours and it was very hard having to do both speeches up until the beginning of August. I was delivering both speeches at clubs, but that's how I got familiar was I just kept standing up and delivering. Long answer, I hope it helped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a lot of work went into that now that I'm <laughs> hearing yeah, no, the behind the you, scenes. Yeah, you can't actually, and that's why I wanted to ask other people who've reached the finals and it's, yeah, I know many of them, the, how many attempts they've gone through to just get there. This is not a one-sort thing. This is, I mean, I've been a Toastmaster for 10 years. I've had to build the skills and abilities. Some people, you know, get to the finals in their second year of being a Toastmaster, so there's not a rule, but it does take a lot of effort and intention. Cool. We've got a few more questions. I don't think we're going to get to all of them, um, but I noticed Winnie unmuted herself. Did you mean to put up your hand? Um, if so, let me know. Otherwise, Rebecca in the chat has said, what informed your choice of a coach and mentor in this journey? Were they existing or did you have to get them on the way? Okay, so my sister is always my coach and mentor. After 2012, we agreed never to enter the contest on this in the same year. So I mentor her when she enters, she mentors me when I enter. So she was already there. Um, but then I reached out to Lance Miller, the 2005 world champion, to be my coach. I paid for that coaching. I paid a lot of money for my coaching. I bought Prez Vazilev's compelling storytelling course. Um, my, co my club actually supported me in, in getting funds to do all of that. But if you don't invest in getting professional coaching for this level of contest, I think it's very hard to do well. If I hadn't had Lance's and also an international eye, so someone who wasn't South African and didn't have our perspective, he pushed me and, and held me to a high stand in my speeches. And I mean, a week before district, he looked at my speech and was like, there's a lot you need to do. And I'd already won three levels. I was like, what? I didn't want to listen to him. My ego was a little bit, what does he know? He won in 2005. Surely things have changed. Verity, listen. And I applied what he taught me and I was, it was, it made enough of a difference to win district. So let me just quickly tell you what I, he taught me so that you can apply it to your speeches. When you are writing a speech, a really good formula to follow is tell a story. So you need to tell that story well, it can be any story like boiling an egg, but tell that story that makes a point, which is your message, which is always what we're trying to get to as speakers. But the final step was the game changer for me. And he said, then show how that point has been applied into your own life and how you changed. And through sharing your transformation with the audience, it opens up their minds to say, hey, I want to try that too. And then you are not stuck trying to lecture the audience on you should be more this and try this and do this. It's more, I was stuck. I tried this. Look how I changed. Hey, here you go. Do you want to try too? So tell a story that makes a point and show how you applied it in your life. Then there's a very short call to action needed at the end of your speech. But 
choose a coach that you admire, watch previous champions, see the speeches that move you, reach out to them and see if you can get that support. Look for support outside of our borders, I think, just so that we get the international eye. Um, it really helps. I don't think I would have won if I hadn't spoken around the world. I think that's why we haven't won to this point, because we've always been practicing for ourselves and we need to hear that international feedback. But put yourself out there and uh, work with a mentor in your club. And as you go further up, con consider paying someone to coach you. I see our time, so I'm sorry. No, absolutely. <laughs> I think that I think that wraps us up beautifully. And um, we've got a few uh, wonderful comments pouring in. I think you can just have a read through them at your leisure. Um, there are a few um, more questions there. If you have time to give them a quick pop them an answer, do so. But if not, sorry, guys, we will try and have her around again at the next event. <laughs> Please send me the questions and I'm going to start, we're going to start an Instagram, Facebook live sessions where I answer questions. So maybe if I can get sent these, I'd love to, to answer cool. them. So at I am Verity, you can find her on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Thank you everyone. so much for joining us today. Cheers. Congratulations again. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Cool. Oh, wonderful. I'm sure you all will agree that was quite a treat. And apologies, I couldn't get to everybody. Um, we have one more segment left for today. And uh, it is, uh, Louis, just for your FYI, it's 15 minutes. Um, you can stretch it to 20 if you like, because we we bought a little bit of time. So that's up to you. I'll, I'll, I'll mark your time at 10, 13, and 15 with the lights as per usual. All right, great stuff. So, let us get on to our next presenter, who is Louis Negrini. Louis is a two-time Southern African champion of speech evaluation and also author of the booklet, Effective Evaluation. For his day job, Louis is an international executive coach and facilitator, specializing in leadership, management, and communication. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our presenter for the Effective Evaluations, Louis Negrini. Over to you, Louis. Thank you, Anka. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And Verity, congratulations again, ladies and gentlemen. We are in the presence of greatness. So please, uh, you know, understand where we are and uh, and where we are coming from. Verity, thank you so much for all your insights and specifically the remark with regards to evaluations. Ladies and gentlemen, like Verity said, we grow by getting feedback. We grow by by not just being in our own minds about what's good and what's not but about really going out and putting ourselves out there and asking for feedback. Earlier, Namonde said, you know, wisdom is shared. And if we go out and ask for feedback, we can get it. And, and, and Toastmasters has created a, a very nice place in the form of evaluations, which is there to provide the speaker with feedback for specific things that the speaker can improve on. But also, the feedback is not given to the individual over there in the corner. It is given in front of everyone. It is given to the whole club. And as I'm watching Marcus's speech and I'm providing feedback to Marcus on what in his speech struck me or what, what worked or what didn't work, it's not just Marcus's learning. It's everybody else's learning in that place to be able to say, wow, oh, I can do that in my speech as well. Oh, wow, I can apply that as well. And, and, and just to echo Verity, if you, if you want to be great at writing a speech, do more evaluations because the way that you think about speeches, the way that you think about structure and, and triads and, and humor and, you know, driving the point home, that becomes real the moment that you think about having someone else. So when we talk about evaluation specifically, one of the core things that, that we need to start off with is it's not about me. It is about the person that I'm delivering the feedback to, that I'm giving the feedback to. And in 20, uh, 2012, Ryan Avery delivered his winning speech at Toastmasters with the, the, the title, Trust is a Must. And that is foundational to us as providing evaluations, is that we must be there and I must understand that the speaker trusts me and trusts my feedback and trusts that what I'm about to give them is for their benefit. In our practice, we, we, we say that trust is defined as knowing that the other person has got my best interest at heart. 
So if I'm providing feedback to Marcus on his speech, I'm not there to take him out at the knees. I'm not there to make him look bad. I'm not there to make myself look better. I'm there to provide feedback for Marcus's benefit and for the benefit of everybody else in our organization. So like Marcus said earlier, yeah, feedback is the breakfast of champions. Sometimes it's a dog's breakfast, but it's good and necessary for us to have, to really go through and understand that this is how we grow by providing feedback and also putting ourselves in the position to actually give it. So just in short, why, why do we give feedback? And if I can ask you just to, to drop into the chat, what, what do you think is the reason for us to provide feedback to speeches, to life in general? If we can get some feedback while I go to the first one. So the why, um, Simon Sinek has this, this whole uh, uh, talk that he has about understanding the why. And that's a good question to ask every time before we do something is why. We're having a meeting. Why? Because it's nine o'clock on a Monday. But, but, but why? Why do we have the meeting? Why do we have uh, impromptu speaking as part of Toastmasters? Why have we got evaluations? Why do I love my wife? In order. <laughs> Thank you for that feedback. I appreciate it. So why do we have this? Why have we got feedback? Well, there are three main things that I would just like to leave with you. The first one is we provide feedback to educate. And to educate can, can mean that either I'm providing you with new information, like, like uh, Anka said earlier, oh, that was a triad. And if you're new to Toastmasters, triad is if you have three words that have the same starting syllable. So it's actually, you know, uh, stoic, sincere, and strength-like. It's the SSS and it's a triad and it grabs your ear and it gives attention. And someone listening to that for the first time can go like, oh, wow. Maybe that's something I could include in my speech writing. So we're not just educating the person we're giving this feedback to, but the every, all the starters, all the people that are there for the first time to go like, wow, that's something I can use even in the next speech I'm giving at the next wedding. The next part is we provide feedback to empower. Now, the definition of empower is I would like you to do what you need to do without my intervention. It's the whole story of, you know, giving a man a fish or teaching him how to fish. It's, it's doing it or teaching him how to do it on his own for himself and understanding why that is the way we do things. We have a, a mindset of helping. And that's the core driver if we talk about evaluations is I'm here to help. It is competition. You are there to be the best evaluator that you can be. The best evaluator that you can be is one that has a serving and helping heart to say, how can I help you do that better for yourself next time? And finally, the last one is we do evaluations to inspire. I, I, I was in Toastmasters many, many years ago, and I, I saw an evaluation, and that evaluation cons convinced me never to go back to that club because it was so poisonous and, and so actually demeaning, like, like but you're bad and you, you, know, you, you call yourself a good Toastmaster, but this sucks and this is bad. And I felt inspired not to go back. So when we provide feedback, if it's in work, if it's at speeches, if anything, we provide feedback, why? Because I want to give you the motivation to want to come back and try again. You know, I always say, you know, if you fall off the, if you fall off the bike, get up again. That takes motivation. That takes an inner ability to want to do it. And that's what the evaluations is for, to get people excited. They're like, wow, I'm going to go try that. And for that, when we have an approach, when we, when we structure our feedback, there are two things that we look at. And it's not good and bad. The way we structure our feedback is to say we look at the good and we look at the growth. And we try to balance those, that we don't just give like, oh, Verity, you're amazing. You're the best thing that's ever happened to the speech. Yay! Because guess what? That's not what Verity came for. She wants to know what she can polish. She wants to know how she can be better next time. And also, we want to inspire the rest of the audience to go like, wow. Oh, I see why that worked. I understand what the structure is with regards to that. So, ladies and gentlemen, the, if we talk about how we do this, a good way to, to, to educate and to empower is to illustrate, to educate. So let's say I would like to show someone that, um, you know, the, the way that they are, um, how can I say this? Um, 
you know, when they speak, they use their hand as a metronome. And that is kind of distracting because every time I'm looking at the hand more than I'm looking at or listening to the words. So by illustrating this, people can go like, oh, I can see what he's referring to. Even if I didn't know how to mention it, I can see and understand why that might be bothersome. And then we follow up with, okay, next time you can do this. This is a great method to use if you want to, to have body language, if you want to, to, to uh, you know, help people understand the value of a pause. And you can do that in your feedback. You can give it, you can illustrate so that everybody in the room, including the speaker, can understand and go like, that's what I want. That's how we're going to get it. So here is the structure that Kathy Angus and I came up with many, many years ago that we follow when we provide feedback. So this is our feedback structure. You are happy to copy it, um, but the outcome here is more important than anything else. So many times I've seen evaluators that, uh, you know, thank you, I've got now got three minutes, which means that if you're writing a speech of seven minutes, you've got about 900 words. If you're writing, if you're giving feedback of three and a half, three to three and a half minutes, you've got about 250 to 300 words to speak. That's it. So choose your words carefully. So, so many times I've seen evaluations giving it like, okay, so let's just get it. Okay, Anka, so um, you started your speech and then they give me a regurgitation of the speech. And then two and a half minutes in when the green light goes on, they're like, okay, so let me tell you what you can change. I was there. I don't need you to regurgitate the speech to me. I want to know what I can be better at. What did I do well? So the format that we use is we start off by saying you start with a good introduction, which is a hi, nice to see you. Thank you for taking the, you know, telling us. And then you can insert this, the, the title of the speech there. Thank you for telling us. My dad is awesome. Then we go into what was good immediately, like second 15, we go like, this is what you did well. And the structure we follow is we give it a name and we'll get to why we give it a name a little bit later, but we give it a name, something congruent. And then we say, this is what you did. And then more importantly, why did it work? I really appreciated the, the way that you made fun at yourself. Why? because it made me feel comfortable to listen to your story. Okay, great. So everybody else is like, okay, so I can tell more self-deprecating humor. Okay, great. Let's, let's do that. Then you follow that with the second good thing that you did. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please hear this. Where do we grow? Not by people telling us that we're great the whole time, but when we go and say, you know what, what you can improve, what you can polish, what you can be even a little bit better at. And here's the challenge that we can do. We do not just need to look for the bad things. Oh, this sucks. We can look at something goes like that is at 85%. And I think if you tweak it a little bit like this, it can be 95%. We are not there to catch someone else. We're there to help them be better at what they are. So we would start with two good things and then we would go over to three growth points. We would give it a title. We would say, what did you do? And what was the effect thereof? And if it didn't work, we would show or we'd show an improvement or provide a, a something else. So, you know, what you can do next time is maybe not use your hand, but put your hand down and use it as an emphasis. So if you really want to make a point to pick up your hand and then put it down again. Now it's practical for everybody to understand. And we can focus on that for about two or three uh, of the feedback forms that we have. And that is followed by uh, just a good conclusion. And the conclusion we got in conclusion, title one, title two. For the growth points, we've got title three, title four, and title five. Thank you so much for the opportunity to help and speak to you as an evaluator. Best of luck with your next speech. Done. Three and a half minutes, three minutes, 25 seconds, completed. So when we look at the breakdown that we had for for this, we would normally say that the introduction is 15 seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd speak at about two to two and a half words per second, depending on how fast you speak or how slow you like to take it. So 15 seconds is 30 words. Hi, get it. And that is something you can practice. Then we talk about the good things for about a minute. 30 seconds, get in, get to the point. What did you do well? Good. What did you do well? Good. Then we move over to, to the transition to the growth points. And you will see that it's almost double the time that we spend. Why? Because this is what you did. This is why it didn't work. And this is my suggestion. 
Second one, this is what you did. This is what didn't work. And this is my suggestion. And this is a structure that we follow. And then at the end, we conclude. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please hear me. The conclusion is not a place to introduce anything new. It's just reflectively looking back. So the structure that we have is we name it, we unpack it, we name it again, and we close. That is how we approach feedback as a very structured way when giving it. I hope this is practical enough. Um, I think we still have like two minutes, Anke. If there are any questions, you can just unmute yourself. Anybody else that would like to ask questions or just anybody else? Yeah, you got two minutes. Two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, floor is open. You can just raise your hand or unmute yourself, ask the question. Let's see if there's any, any way we can help you. <laughs> Education is the reason. Yeah. Yeah, we look for the good and the growth points to educate and to inspire. Absolutely. Name it, we unpack it, name it again. Yes, Namonde. That's the structure that we follow. And that helps us to also help the other one. A good question to ask is, how can I best support Anna-Marie now with this speech? What's going to be the most impactful for her in this speech now, but also for her as a speaker going forward? If we have that help attitude, that makes a lot of difference. Um, any other questions before I hand back to Anka? Going once, going twice, and the words of my mother go away. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Anka, over to you. <laughs> Many thanks, Louis. Let me just get myself spotlighted back here. There we go. And get rid of this ugly yellow background and put my blur on because. If you see my nun, you'll see the messy blankets and the fan and the things. And as Namonde said, we want to neutralize that background. <laughs> so for effective evaluations, oh, wow. That was really, really valuable, Louis. Thank you for taking us through that. And the importance of the structure of an evaluation. I didn't actually realize how much I was regurgitating people's speeches at the start of my evaluations. Um, so it's something for me to take to heart. And I think that that really um, gave us a lot of ideas on how to structure our feedback in the most effective way possible so that someone actually gets something out of that evaluation. Now, what we are going to do next is open the floor for questions for the rest of the session. Um, so these are any questions that you might have for um, in relation to any of the topics that have been discussed this evening. Um, a couple of our facilitators have had to drop off due to other commitments, um, but those who are still around, uh, including myself, are available to answer questions. So now is your chance. Do you have any questions related to doing a, a giving a good, great, great table topic, to delivering an effective evaluation, or any questions about giving a great speech? Please go ahead pop them in the chat or put your hand up. Can you or hear unmute me? unmute yourself. Yes, go ahead, Lucy. Okay, um, I would like to know about, to ask a question about effective evaluation. If you are starting evalu to evaluate people, what sort of material can you empower yourself with so that you give um, the relevant um, information to, to, to the speakers? Thank you, I hope I, it's clear, thanks. <laughs> Lucy, I think uh, one of the most important things is to be true to yourself. And it's like, it's like Nicholas said earlier, I can't talk about something that I don't know. So as we grow in speakers, we, we know what the structure is supposed to look like or what you know, some tips or tools are that we can incorporate. But if you're asked to give an evaluation, the most best thing you can do is just to be honest, to say, I didn't get it. I, I, or thank you, that was amazing. I really felt or you know, how you could take me along. So if you would like to be have more to give feedback on do more speeches think it through ask yourself the question why was what jan just said really impactful to me why is that why why am i getting bored in this speech now why did i find that specific word offensive why did and if you ask yourself those questions that's the question that the rest of the audience is, is asking and like verity said earlier we write a speech uh, for ourselves but also for the, for, for the audience so if you're in the audience and you've got experience that's what you can reflect on with honesty. So do that. Later, we can get into as you grow in your knowledge of structure and, you know, the, the triads and, you know, big words we use on Toastmasters about how to structure our speech and build it and the technical things that we can really drill down into. 
if you don't have experience in that, then say what you want to say from honesty from, from, from yourself. I hope that helps, Lucy. Cool. Thanks, Louis. All right. Um, we've got another question in the chat also evaluation related. The, um, is the takeaway from the evaluation section <clears throat> that we should not requote the quotes we loved that the speaker mentioned? No. If it's stuck out for you, then please do so. My pet peeve is if I'm listening to a three and a half minutes uh, uh, evaluation and three minutes past where someone is just regurgitating a seven minute speech into three minutes. So if it stood out for you, mention it. I really appreciated the fact that you said, you know, the quote that you had from, from Nelson Mandela that says education can change the world. Oh, so I should include that in my speech because it has impact. So if we mention it, there must be a reason, either good or growth, about why we want to bring it to the fore. We can't just mention things and hope that, you know, something sticks and something lands. Does that make sense? Cool. It does to me. Sorry. <laughs> that was Amukelani in the chat. So Amukelani, thank you very much for the question. And I hope that made sense for your answer. Do we have any other questions? I see we just got a comment here of appreciation saying the session was quite rich and that they've learned a lot. So yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. We really hope this was useful. The last session that we did like this was contest speaker mastery. And that was the session that we did with a dream of someone in district 74 becoming the champion. So we kind of feel like, you know, Verity achieved it, but we kind of achieved it too. <laughs> Now we've got from Rebecca. Louis, that was informative. What is your take on giving people more good things and one thing to improve? If you have, for instance, two other things, give it to the speaker outside the meeting, perhaps. In my opinion, yeah. then, if you do that, you have robbed me of what I could have learned if I was in the audience. How do you balance, how do you balance being seen as a nice evaluator, or rather, how do you balance the evaluation with the speaker being ready to receive evaluation? So, Anka, I think there's a, um, and Rebecca, to your point, I think there's a, there's a very distinct line here. I don't want to be known as the nice evaluator. I want to know that my evaluations have got impact and helped you. And if you're a new speaker and you just did your first speech, I'm not going to go like, oh, that sucked. Oh, buddy, are you sure you want to be a Toastmasters? So then we, we put on the praise and we make everything possible to make that person have self-esteem to try again. That's where the inspire part comes from. But we also want to help them to say, so next time, you know, maybe um, just hold your notes in your one hand that we only see one hand shaking, but something to put them forward. So we can't just give yippee yay, everything is great. And we also can't just give, oh, you suck and everything is bad. We need to have a balance there. So if your balance is two good things and, and, and one growth point, and that takes up to three minutes, please have at it. Have a conversation and make it as informative as possible. We are at the end of the, the, the day trying to serve the speaker. Yes, we are also trying to serve the audience, but if the speaker needs to have and understand why that specific point was not helpful and how they can improve it, we can drill down into that. I hope that answers the question. We don't want to give them seven things because that's too much. We don't just want to give them one thing because seriously, you've got three minutes, but to have a balance at least of something that was good that they can carry on doing and something that can grow in and change a little bit or fundamentally change to be better next time. Mm. I'll also just pitch in there. Um, I mean, I've been, been taught various methods of evaluation, one being the, the sandwich method of evaluation, evaluation, where you say one good thing, one thing to improve on, and another good thing. And I think it's a very, it's a very tame way of evaluating, and it's a very um, scared to kind of hurt the other people's feelings, and it's, it's, it's best for very, very new speakers. Um, but I think when you've been a Toastmaster for a while, the, the formula that's worked best for me is here are three things that you did really well. Here is two things that I think you can work on. And here's one more thing just to push yourself. So yeah. using that formula has been, been my most winning one. Um, I see we got some more questions. Um, so the next one is Amakulani again for speech writing. Does it matter whether you start at the body or the introduction? Is there a specific order to write your speech? Do you want to take that one, Linda? 
Yes, actually. <laughs> so I, I read the question and I was trying to think about it. Here's the best advice. Or oh, here's my suggestion in that matter. Work chronologically, right? You don't want to eat dessert before you have the vegetables. So I'm a sweet tooth, so that's how I work. But the suggestion is work chronologically. Start with your introduction, then go to your body, then go to your conclusion. Because then it builds, it, there's, no, there's no right way to write a speech. If you feel like your body, you've got your points down pat, work on that and then go to your introduction and go to your conclusion. But just for chronological sake, work on your introduction, build on that because that's where your message is usually planted. Then substantiate your background and then close it off. I, I hope that answers your question correctly. Just Thanks, Linda. That, that's some great advice. I also have some um, input from my side, ha having recently ha had to write a speech. <laughs> and um, it, what I found I really needed before I could figure out how I even wanted to introduce the speech was I needed my three main points. And I really made a point of, I was doing the research and presenting project. So I made a point of researching my topic thoroughly and really deciding on what those three aspects were that I wanted to cover before I wrote my introduction, because my introduction were priming the people up for the body. Mm. Um, so I think that that is a tactic that can also work. True, true. Cool. Um, the next question was, are evaluations subjective? I don't know if you want to pop back in, Louis. The short answer is yes and no. So, so as a middle-aged white man, my, my view on a specific topic might be fundamentally different to an attractive young man like, like, like Marcus. So I am coming from my point of view and I need to express that without being offensive or without saying, oh, that's the way I have it, so that's the only truth. So is it subjective? Yes. Uh, if, if, if I'm finding uh, your content, your subject matter to be not funny, I can share that. But... I don't want to make that the ultimate truth because my experience might be different to Anka, might be different to my twin person, might be different to someone that's in another country in another way, you know, uh, providing it in, 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 in a different way. So to Verity's points earlier, she could get feedback, amazing feedback from South Africans about her speech, subjectively. Take that same speech to Ireland and we'll have a completely different view on it and take on it. So there's always going to be a level of subjectivity that pops into it. It's just, are you going to use that as a, as a hammer to hit someone over the head? Or are you going to acknowledge that and say, from my point of view? And I think that's a good way to qualify things. Say, from my point of view, my experience was not to say, everybody thought that you sucked. That's not going to help everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I could be a fly on the wall in that meeting where you said you, you just they were just saying everything sucks I mean like I, I can't imagine the feelings anyway uh, thankfully the the Toastmasters meetings I've been at have had a little bit more of the opposite where people are struggling to find things to improve on <laughs> so I see there's a word of encouragement in the chat uh, no more qu questions that I've seen but Copano has said a word of encouragement to those wanting to grow quickly. Enter a contest. The level of growth that happens within the contest process is incredible and such an advantage to anyone who has ever taken this route. So whatever you want, wherever you want to grow, take a leap of faith and enter the contest. So take that to heart, folks. <laughs> Do we have any final questions before I wrap us up for this morning? Okay, I don't see any hands. Oh, there's a hand, Dylan. Dylan, please go ahead. Good morning, thank you for the opportunity. So my question is, I haven't really packaged it too well, so I hope you can pick up, I'll narrate it a bit. It is on speaking style, being a more diverse speaker. I have noticed that my speaking style is more informational and that does not always appeal to all types of audiences. You know, you may want to be more conversational when you present, you maybe want to be more humorous when you present. So how can I make that transition from my comfort zone of being an informational speaker to incorporating all these other various aspects as for example, we saw in Verity's speech. 
so as to appeal more to the audience than just sticking to being someone who is full of facts and to the point. Okay. Would any of my facilitators like to take a stab at that? I can make a contribution. Dylan, uh, it is said that growth only does not happen in your comfort zone. So if you would like to grow as a speaker, it is really to take that step out and say, can I just tell a story? Um, and I think with that as well is it depends on what's the impact that you would like your speech to have. So if you're at a NASA convention, please stick to the facts. Don't come with, you know, la da and do a little dance. The engineers won't understand that. However, if you are telling a story to a bunch of high school kids, don't bore them with the facts. Give them something fundamental to chew on and custom make your, your, your speech to the audience that you have. With that being said, you have a message to, to get across and be true to that, but use the tools that you have available, storytelling, uh, the way that you structure a speech, humor as tools. And what I'm hearing now is you're a hammer and you're great at hammering things. So now the challenge is to take, the, to take up the, the next challenge to say, okay, I'm gonna use my saw now. Let's see how that works. Let's see what the benefits are that I can do with a saw that I can't do with a hammer. And as you grow, you'll find your ticks and tools. You, you'll still have your natural flavor, but those extra tools just kind of adds a little bit of, of complexity to, to a very good message that you already have, just packaging in, in a way that makes it maybe a little bit more uh, palatable for, 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 for different audiences. Anka, that's my contribution. Awesome, I thank you. <laughs> I, I like that feedback. I, I also see some feedback from Rebecca on that note. In my growth, I went to storytelling and integrating the points and information. I've become more converse conversational also, I think. <laughs> cool, and Dylan says thanks. All right. Time for one last question, if anyone has one. All right, if not, then I will just alert you to our next contest themed training, uh, which will be next week, Saturday. I believe it's a judging workshop. Sonata, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that is correct. Tim, Tim Knights will be facilitating that workshop. Um, so please do come along, uh, learn how to get your judging skills shaped up for the next contest season. Other than that, I'm going to close us off for today. Um, Linda, did you want to say a few words to wrap up as TLI coordinator? Thank you everyone for attending this morning. I had said it was an amazing session. Thank you to all the speakers. You have shown your expertise. And thank you for giving us this little nugget of, of wisdom. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their Saturday. And with that being said, Anka, take over so we can be released. <laughs>